In 2008, more than 16% of energy consumed in Europe was generated by renewable sources. By 2030, the EU wants to double that figure, which means increased hydroelectric power. More on that later, but for now, welcome to Echo Africa, the environment magazine brought to you from Lagos, Nigeria. Here's what we have for you today. A new generation of solarpreneurs is emerging in Africa. We visit Yeshu Abdu in Niger. And in Ethiopia, a community is trying to preserve part of a forest for humans and animals. Then we visit a photographer who has a thing for the insect world. Poverty, disease, migration, civil war. This is what you find in the headlines that involve Africa. And they often paint a picture of misery and hardship. The continent's success stories in research and science hardly get the coverage that they deserve. In future, Senegalese fishermen might be able to use an app to calculate how much fish they can catch today without devastating the fish population of tomorrow. That is vital as the fish stocks are shrinking along the country's sea coast while the population continues to increase. Now, the African Institute for Mathematical Science, which has its founding also in Senegal's capital, Dakar, is developing and testing an app that could help sustainably pursue the livelihood of these fishermen. The city of Mbour is the center of Senegal's fishing industry. Here, catches are still good. But the country's population is growing, so demand is on the rise. And more and more fishermen are casting their nets in the same waters. Will there be enough fish to feed everyone in the future? Mathematicians are trying to find out. These fishermen are taking a break. That gives Kwabena Owusu the chance to tell them about his research project. The doctoral student comes from Ghana, so his Senegalese colleague translates for him. Their team is looking for fishermen to take part in an experiment. And in that case, we need each of you to help us with that, because you are the main people on the ground learning the language. Using a cell phone app, the fishermen will report the amounts of fish they caught and how long they were at sea. We will also be looking at a way we can sustain the fisheries and what we do is the extract from the experiments will be analyzed statistically and after that we actually model it using a belief revision models, that is another bunch of mathematics and with that it is hoped that it will help to design and implement the continual improvement of the fisheries. The researchers never lose sight of the reason for their research. They can see the ocean from their workplace at the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences, or AIMS for short. And German researcher Gunnar Brandt is a partner in the project. Kwabena Owusu tells him about his talk with the fishermen. Brandt and his colleagues at Bremen's Leibniz Center for Tropical Marine Ecology came up with the idea of modeling the fishermen's activities mathematically. Their experiment is just one of several cooperative projects at Ames. Established four years ago, the center in Senegal is part of a pan-African network of Ames institutes. They nurture the mathematical skills of the continent's brightest students. What it seeks to do is to discover the next Einstein. They actually believe that for Africa to develop, then we need to first develop the mind, the brains of the African so that the African itself can help, bring, uh, can help develop Africa. The spectrum of research is broad, spanning both theoretical and applied mathematics. And top researchers from around the globe come here to give lectures and workshops. At Ames, the hierarchies are flat. To be an internationally recognized center of excellence means being open to unconventional ideas. So Professor Mohamed Fall's door is always open to young researchers like Kwabena Owusu. In my understanding, you may be, the teacher may have more experience, better say more knowledge, a lot of knowledge, but the students might be more intelligent. So it's better to always discuss and to see the way that the people, the students understand things. Whether the mathematicians will be able to help the fishermen of Mbour remains unclear. But their research shows that they're serious about trying to improve life in Africa.
The International Energy Agency estimates that more than half the population of Sub-Saharan Africa lacks access to electricity, and those that do rely on fossil fuel. A number of companies and organizations on the continent have identified solar power as a solution. A new breed of solar pioneers is emerging, increasing access to power and generating revenue at the same time. Along with some friends, Yeshu Abdu from Niger founded a small company that uses renewables to raise food security in rural areas. This is the first test run before delivery. The workers at Guimafor are assembling solar panels that can power grain mills. The idea came from Yeshehu Abdu. Along with friends, he founded a cooperative to start his business. In rural areas, women had to grind grains by hand or with diesel-powered mills. Now those days are over. Yeshu Abdu has already sold four machines to communities. Each one cost the equivalent of just over 450 euros. The grain mills function with solar energy alone. You don't need to store any reserves. You don't need diesel fuel. One mill can provide for a village of up to 10,000 people. Yeshua Abdu was supported by the Sipman Startup Center in Niamey. Here, young entrepreneurs can meet, work together and network. They develop apps, GPS systems for transport companies, or they have new ideas for the energy sector. Up to now, Niger was not known as a hotspot for company launches, as the center's director explains. Business culture is not widespread in society here. Many people work in the informal sector. And today we are trying, with our structure and the possibilities we have, to change this mentality. Many people in Niger get by with occasional jobs or by working as unskilled laborers. For anyone wanting to start up a company, it's hard to get a bank credit or a startup loan. Here, too, the Sipman Center wants to help. We catalyze many actors who can help the young entrepreneurs implement their ideas. For example, we establish contact with the minister or with state institutions. And in the private sector, too, we open doors so that they can start their business. Yeshu Abdu has succeeded. With his grain mills, he has filled a business niche. For the population at large, he invented a solar-powered multiple socket strip. It can be used to charge 25 cell phones, lamps and other equipment. He's filling a gap in the market. Between the time when I started my business and today, growth has been fast. The sector has experienced a real boom. And the population has come to see solar and photovoltaic equipment as a new way to obtain energy. The entrepreneur now employs five young men who deliver and set up the equipment in villages throughout the country. Yeshua Abdu's company aims to sell solar-powered grain mills together with solar panels in at least 100 villages in Niger by next year. There is no getting away from the fact that climate change is affecting the world we live in. As I speak, glaciers are melting, farmers are having to adapt to shifting weather patterns, and in many cases are facing drought. These changes are directly related to the emission of so-called green gases. Our next piece explains. Our climate is changing, and temperatures in general are increasing on the planet. Sea levels are rising, and the ice is melting at the North and South Poles. One reason for this is the greenhouse effect. But what is the greenhouse effect? A greenhouse is normally something useful. It helps us grow things like tomatoes out of season. That's because it's nice and warm inside a greenhouse. The sunlight enters and visible light penetrates the glass. This is partly absorbed by the plants in the soil and partly reflected on the outside as invisible heat radiation. As a result, temperatures rise inside the greenhouse. The planet Earth obtains warmth in a similar fashion, which is fortunate because otherwise we could not survive. 
Without the natural greenhouse effect, temperatures on our planet would be around minus 18 degrees Celsius, and not the average 15 degrees Celsius above freezing. Sunlight penetrates the gas layer of the atmosphere. It's partly absorbed and partly reflected, just like in a greenhouse. Small particles in the air ensure that a percentage of the reflected radiation is sent back to Earth. However, humans cause a lot of pollution by producing large amounts of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide. The small particles increase in number, and the result is just like a greenhouse where the glass is too thick. So an increased amount of radiation is sent back to Earth and the heat is unable to escape causing temperatures to rise constantly on our planet. Staying with green, over the next 15 years, the European Union is aiming to generate about 27% of its energy through renewables. As a role model, Germany plays an important part in the process. But there is more to green energy transition than simply shutting down nuclear and coal plants because what happens when there's neither wind nor sun to keep the continents ticking? What's needed is storage, and that's where Norway comes in. Its vast hydroelectric power plants could function as giant batteries for the whole continent. Let's check it out. Water, water everywhere. In addition to oil and gas deposits, abundant water makes Norway one of Europe's most important energy producers. Tall mountains and high precipitation make ideal conditions for hydropower. Blosje, the country's largest reservoir, lies at an elevation of over a thousand meters. Fourteen dams ensure the pumped storage power station connected to it always has enough water. The turbines deep within the bedrock generate 2,000 megawatts an hour, more than a nuclear power station. The water coming into this turbine starts to rotate the turbine. The generator rotates, and then we produce power. So simple as it. But this power station can do more than generate electricity from flowing water. It can also store electricity. If there is a surplus of wind and solar energy, it is used to pump water back up into the mountain. The water is stored for periods when there's no solar or wind power available. This system could also temporarily store energy from Germany at the Ula Fore power complex. Both the German and Norwegian electricity grids would have to be expanded first. Most of all, it would require a high capacity cable link between the two countries. The Dutch have had access to the Norwegian power grid since 2008. Denmark has several cable connections to its northern neighbor. A similar link to Britain is in the works. The submarine cable to Germany is under construction. But the grid operator Statnet would like to do more than just export energy to Germany. The whole idea here is uh, to exchange power so that when there is a surplus of wind power and solar power in Germany, we can import that for a reasonable price. And when you haven't got sun, you haven't got wind, and you have a larger demand, then we can export our hydropower for a reasonable price to Germany. The link to Germany will cost about 2 billion euros. That's likely to raise energy prices in Norway, where heating is almost exclusively electric. No other country in the world uses as much electricity per capita. Once Germany has completely phased out nuclear energy, it will need to tap Norway's reservoirs. But the hydropower plant at Ula Fore is running nowhere near capacity. We have analyzed it, and of course it's possible to increase the pump storage capacity without do, doing anything with the reservoirs, with the tunnels, with the dams. The country's power companies are ready and willing. Starting in 2020, Germany will be able to store electricity from wind and solar energy sources in Norway.
Chances are that you know or have met someone who's called Paul, but let me introduce you to a clever namesake. The portable aqua unit for life saving, aka Paul, is a brilliant invention from the University of Kasse in Germany, which is used to supply drinking water to people in the aftermath of natural catastrophe. Let's see how the researchers have been doing their bit. War, earthquakes, and extreme weather cause mass destruction and lead to conditions where disease can spread quickly. Temporary drinking water facilities are costly to transport and install, and often too big for small villages. A research team at the University of Kassel has come up with a versatile solution. Its name is Paul. It's a portable backpack that allows a decentralized supply of clean water in disaster situations. It is equipped with membranes that filter out almost 100% of lethal bacteria to produce 1,200 liters of drinking water a day. When empty, Paul weighs 22 kilos. It needs no electricity or chemicals and is very easy to use. With a lifespan of 10 years, Paul is already successfully used in over 50 countries. We like that. If you are also doing your bit, tell us about it. Visit our website or send us a tweet. Hashtag doing your bit. We'll share your stories. And we are back in Africa where a community in Ethiopia has learned to see its environment through different eyes. The Sheka Forest is one of the country's largest and last remaining tropical forests. Not only do trees there protect soil from erosion and take carbon dioxide out of the air, they also provide rich habitats in which different species of animals, birds and insects can flourish. In order to ensure its survival, clan leaders, the local community and the local government have joined forces to find sustainable ways of living with and from the forest. Descending into the magical heart of the Sheka Tropical Forest. Home to the unique birds of the Shesheko Fall. These birds can be found nowhere else, explains teacher Melaku Areto. Only here at this cave next to the waterfall. The Carraro tree, found only in Ethiopia, also grows here extensively. The forest is very important for the people. Everyone breathes the fresh air it gives. Without it, people wouldn't exist. The Sheka forest is vast, covering more than 2,300 square kilometers in southwest Ethiopia. It's one of the country's last remaining green belts. The area is home to many rare and threatened species. There is a core zone that is specially protected and a development zone. This area includes Masha, the largest town in the region, home to 50,000 people. And population numbers are growing. The Sheka Forest is designated by UNESCO as a global biosphere reserve. The development zone, which makes up roughly half the area, is supposed to be used in a sustainable way. But more and more forest is being cleared to make way for farming. Beehives offer one alternative source of income. The Ethiopian aid organization Melka bought the hives and began offering local farmers training in beekeeping. The program is partly funded by the International Climate Initiative. By that process, the communities came out, came from the forest, and they are uh, working with together. And what is the advantage of this working? If they are starting the, the modern beehives as a group, most of the trees can, cannot be cut. Thanks to the honey that we sell, we can buy clothes for our children and books for their schooling. We can pay our taxes and make our homes better. The lula tree is on the list of endangered species. 
This one stands in the garden of Dakito Atestata, a respected clan leader. Those who come to listen to him keep a respectful distance. The authority that he exercises plays an important role in helping to protect the forest. Anyone who cuts down a tree without permission must pay with an ox. The lula tree is sacred to the people here and used in prayer rituals. Cutting it down would be out of the question. Our holy places have existed for many generations. They were chosen by our ancestors. We go there to pray for rain and for a good harvest. They are places where the gods listen to us. The core zone of the forest is specially protected. No one is allowed to clear trees here. The people of Sheka live in the forest and from the forest. And that's the only way to ensure it remains protected. Flowers, their beauty and existence is usually tied to the existence of insects. But few people are as familiar with insects as the British photographer Levon Biss, who transforms their tiny frames into giant images using a special microscopic photographic technique. The results are on display in Oxford, England. If visitors are as fascinated by the tiny details as a photographer, the pictures could help to cast creepy crawlies in a more positive light. Indeed, that light could be beautiful to you. This is not gold foil. It's the wing of a South American bee, magnified 300 times. And although this might look like a leaf, it is actually the armor of a tropical tree hopper. Insects as we've never seen them before, each with its own surface structure. These images were taken by Levon Biss. He spent two years photographing the insects and during that time, he developed a lot of respect for them. That surprises me how, how complicated these creatures are and at the same time, how beautiful they are. Um, we have this cliched idea of the creepy crawlies being horrible or scary. And you know, they're just not, you know, if you look at it, I don't think there's one single scary picture in this exhibition. Biss named his exhibition Microsculpture. It opened recently at the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. The museum has Britain's second largest insect collection, and Biss was given access to its archives. Entomologist James Hogan worked with Levon Biss to help him find especially beautiful examples. We wanted to have specimens that were not too big, because in general, a lot of large insects have been photographed before, you know, and people are quite familiar with those kind of images. So the specimens were based on uh, things that I knew had an interesting surface detail um, and would be interesting colours. Uh, so there's some insects that have really spectacular metallic colours, for example, um, which I knew would look amazing, uh, you know, after Levon had photographed them. Levon Biss combined 9,000 individual photos to produce the picture of the jewel beetle. Under the microscope, he moved the insect 10 micrometers at a time, a seventh of the width of a hair. It took him three days to take the series of pictures. A sterile workplace was top priority. Insects are around us all the time. You see them all the time, but you don't really see them. It's only when you go all the way in that you can understand how, amazing, how beautiful these thick creatures are. The photographer put the pictures together on a computer. Working with this complex jigsaw puzzle paid off. He was able to create incredible close-ups. Each hair of the beetle can be clearly distinguished. Levon Biss's photos show the structures of the beetle's body and let us explore a new world. Back at Oxford's Museum of Natural History. The photographer and the entomologist both hope the show will get people interested in these insects. I want them to, to have a newfound respect for these creatures, to, to look at them in amazement and you know, be astonished by them and you know, fall in love with them. I hope that it will encourage people to study insects as well, not just appreciate them, but you know, uh, to study them. Uh, because they're just fabulous, really. Microsculpture will be on show in Oxford through October. After that, the exhibition goes on a world tour. 
so that people in other countries too can view the insects with new eyes. Experts say it will take a change of behavior by humans to reduce the negative effects of climate change. In Nigeria, there's a clarion call to corporations and individuals to deliberately stop gas slurring and reduce emissions. That brings us to the end of the show. For more on environmental ideas and solutions, visit our website or check us out on Facebook and Twitter. Join us again next week, same time, same place. Until then, goodbye from Lagos, Nigeria. <laughs>